formula. Chip, thank you very much. A still out crowd on hand here at the Tokyo Dome as the games have been the last two days. Both of these clubs playing in exhibition games. Bobby Valentine and the New York Mets taking the field. And we're just moments away from beginning the 2000 Major League season. Here come the Mets in Tokyo. Mike Hampton will get the ball in the New York season opener. Let's take a look at Don Baylor's Chicago Cubs starting lineup. It'll be Eric Young, recently acquired from the Dodgers, leading off at second. Damon Buford in center field. And Mark Grace is at first. In righty, certainly a big question mark is Todd Zeal taking over for John Olerud. His last start at first base came with Philadelphia in 1996. No problems everywhere else. Terrific second baseman in Edgardo Alfonso. The shortstop, his double playmate, is Ray Ordonez. Ordonez, three consecutive gold gloves, and of course flanking him, and Ventura, who's won six gold gloves. I'm not sure there's anybody flashier than Ray Ordonez at shortstop. Just a marvelous defender. In the outfield, 41-year-old Ricky Henderson. We'll talk a great deal about him tonight. There have been great rumors involving Henderson in center field. Solid, not spectacular. It's Daryl Hamilton. And in right, also coming over from the Houston Astros, Derek Bell. Eric Young just joined the Cubs during the offseason, coming over from the Dodgers, along with Ismael Valdez, Terry Adams, and a number of minor leaguers going from the Cubs to the Dodgers. Talk about history in the making the very first pitch delivered by mike hampton will immediately be taken out of play and that ball will make its way to cooperstown new york in the baseball hall of fame oh, what a moment for mike hampton what a moment for major league baseball opening the 2000 season in the tokyo dome in japan has to be a big thrill for the youngster out there on the mound mike hampton 22 game winner a season ago with the astros a runner up to randy johnson in the National League Cy Young Award. The first pitch of the new millennium, a strike. And the ball is off to baseball immortality. Cooperstown, New York, and the Baseball Hall of Fame. I wonder if baseballs get jet lag flying back to the States, <laughs> all the way to Cooperstown. Catline, press one. <laughs> Welcome to the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo, Japan, where 55,000 fans are jammed together for game two of the Major League season. The New York Mets look to even the series against Sammy Sosa and the Chicago Cubs. And for many, most of these in attendance, perhaps one final look at the greatest players in all the world. And one of the most historic first pitches thrown out in 1998 by Konashiki, the first non-Japanese person to be Grand Sumo Champion, a native Hawaiian. Now you think Fernando Vina is going to hit a pitch by this guy? He's no dummy. 333, Bobby. Some would say that's an ideal playing weight. That is not his weight. Nowhere close to Konishiki's weight. I, I don't think so. I don't know why Vina didn't bunt on him. I don't think he can feel this <laughs> position. When we return, Sammy Sosa and the Cubs trying to go 2-0 against Piazza and the Mets. Zane Proof is the opener last night. It'll be Ricky Henderson leading off playing left field. Daryl Hamilton is in center with Edgardo Alfonso at second base. Mike Piazza hit 40 home runs a season ago, already number one in the season opener last night. Robin Ventura at third base with Derek Bell in right. Todd Seal, the first baseman. Ray Ordonez at short. And Rick Reed, an 11-game winner last season, on the mound. Kyle Farnsworth, a highly touted young right-hander for the Cubs. Uh, the Cubs really like this young man's arm. A 23-year-old, a very hard thrower. Good fastball, a good slider. He's still working on a changeup to be more effective against left-handed hitters. I mentioned a very live arm. Usually has very good control. 
does have trouble controlling the opposition's running game, but once again, other than Ricky Henderson, perhaps Daryl Hamilton, not much of a running threat on this Mets club. Let's take a look at the Chicago Cubs defensively, led by their four-time Gold Glove winning first baseman, Mark Grace. Did he put on a show here last night in the field and at the plate? Eric Young made his Cub debut last night, coming over in the trade with Ismael Valdez from Los Angeles. Shane Andrews had trouble defensively, no problem swinging the back. He homered in the Cub win. Last night, the starting shortstop, Jose Nieves. Tonight, it's Jeff Houston. Ricky Gutierrez is still bothered by a strained ribcage muscle. Longtime veteran Henry Rodriguez, again the nod in left field. Damon Buford came over as a free agent from the Boston Red Sox, and he starts in center. Buford had the first hit of a new millennium last night. And slamming Sammy Sosa. We'll take care of business in right. Joe Girardi originally come. Now he's back with the team behind the plate, and he's working with Kyle Farnsworth, a 23-year-old native of Alpharetta, Georgia. You get a look at his numbers last season, a rather lofty ERA. Among those five victories was a complete game shutout against the Dodgers on August 29th when he allowed only two base hits, a broken bat single to Todd Hollinsworth, and an infield hit to Mark Rezalonic, retired 17 of the final 18 batters. Once again, the Cubs are very impressed by this young man's arm. Ricky Henderson. Reached base twice last night, did not steal a base. He had a single in four at bats and also drew a walk. You see his numbers from last year when he had the best on base percentage of all leadoff hitters in the National League, despite then being 40 years young. Now he's 41 years young. Well, there may be parts of his body that are declining, but his eye at the plate is still very good. He forces pitchers to throw a lot of pitches. First pitch down and in to Henderson. Ball one, and we're underway here at the Tokyo Dome. 55,000 the attendance last night. Should be right on that mark again tonight. Smokes it fouled, even to count a ball to strike. As you heard Chip Carey mention in the open to the show, a lot of work has been done to the home plate area. Some more clay has been added to the dirt behind home plate. You can see how deep Ricky Henderson's back foot is already in that batter's box. We'll see how the batters come out of that box after making contact. Henderson didn't like the call. One ball and two strikes. He'll be followed by Darrell Hamilton and then Edgardo Alfonso. Foul back out of play. Farnsworth in 99 spent most of the season in the major league seeing his first big league action during three stints on the Cubs roster. He made 21 starts appeared in 27 games but a very different pitcher his first two times up than the one that closed the year. He really struggled his first stint got 11 starts with an ERA of over seven and a half but you see there what he did over his last six starts. Boy those are good numbers. Andrews gloves a roller over to third and Henderson retired to begin the game. Well certainly an honor for these umpires and this umpiring crew working tonight's game. Angel Hernandez works behind the plate. Marty Foster at first Ron Culpa at second base and our good buddy Randy Marsh. He worked behind the plate last night. He's at third base tonight. It really is quite an honor not only for us up here at the booth for the umpires for the players for everybody involved to be able to come to Japan for the first opening of a Major League Baseball season outside of North America. Now Daryl Hamilton he looks at ball one low and away. Is that a video camera or binoculars. They get started early here the technology <laughs> and some of the things we've seen that they're selling in various stores or the Sony building the display they had the first nine floors of every high tech gadget you could ever imagine. Fouled out of play. One and two to Hamilton. Now some of the screens that uh, are made available to the writers just in front of us on press row. I believe they call it plasma screens. Is that what they're called? Right. Just amazingly thin television screens with crystal clear pictures. There you get a look at the television that Mr. Brindley was referring to. I saw one of those bigger than 90 inches at that Sony building the other night. Wow. It remains two and two to Hamilton. How are you going to fit that in your luggage? That's what I want. To know. Very good question. <laughs> Ball 
Bobby Valentine out to the ballpark very early today, throwing extra batting practice to Derek Bell before the regular batting practice for both teams. Managers don't do that a lot anymore. Occasionally, you'll see a manager come out very early and throw batting practice, but uh, it's, it's become quite a rarity. Of course, Valentine played the game under protest in the bottom half of the ninth inning. A check swing and a miss, and Hamilton went too far, according to Angel Hernandez, and Farnsworth gets his first strike out of the night. You get a look from up above the Tokyo Dome. You be the umpire. Did Daryl Hamilton? Yes, he did. Got too far out in front of home plate there. Angel Hernandez with a good call. Jeff Houston came on to play late in the game, as did Tarek Brock, as Alfonso settles in with two down and nobody on. Valentine was not aware that either one of those two players was on the Chicago Cubs roster. Thus, he played the game under protest with home plate umpire Randy Marsh, and immediately following the game, when he learned that both were indeed on the 25-man Cubs roster, rescinded the protest. But Don Baylor was none too happy about the gamesmanship displayed by Valentine. Well, Bobby has a reputation of uh, employing some gamesmanship throughout the course of games during the last season, most notably against the Arizona Diamondbacks and their Korean right-hander, byung Hung Kim. And Don Baylor uh, was none too fond of Bobby Valentine's antics last night. In fact, when they introduced the starting lineups, as they do for opening day, back in the States where the players line up the third baseline, the first baseline, the two managers, it's generally custom anywhere to shake hands. They didn't do it tonight. Game on. Absolutely. And you can certainly understand why there was some confusion on the part of Bobby Valentine. Both teams uh, have allowed several players to come along on the trip to Japan who will not be on the regular season roster. And they did that for the exhibition game. Correct. And those players are in uniform tonight, sitting on the bench, observing the game. They aren't eligible to play in the game, but uh, a little bit of confusion on the Met side of the field as to exactly who was on the opening day roster for the Cubs. Alfonso lifts a fly ball down the right field line. Sosa won't catch up with him. It'll stay 3-2 and two to Edgardo Alfonso. We see some faces, just some magical moments here in the crowd last night. Two down, nobody on. Three and two to Alfonso. And Farnsworth with a payoff pitch. Broken bat, base hit center field. So the inning continues from Mike Piazza. Appeared that Farnsworth shook off his catcher Joe Girardi. It appeared Girardi wanted to go inside with the fastball. Farnsworth shook off to an outside fastball, and Alfonso was able to fight it off into center field for a base hit. I believe Farnsworth, being a young pitcher, will improve as the season goes on by working with Joe Girardi, a veteran catcher back there. Well, last night Brian Williams came out of the Chicago bullpen throwing gas, 93, 94 miles per hour. And he kept throwing them to Mike Piazza, who kept fouling him away, fouling him away. But one too many times did Williams come with the heat. And Piazza hammered one to the seats in right center field for a two-run home run. Breaking ball, two breaking balls in a row now to Piazza. This at bat. It's all right to throw breaking balls, but he's still 2-0. and Another fastball count right here. Two balls, no strikes, and a bouncing ball at Andrews. He'll go the short way, and that'll retire the side. One hit, one left. Sammy and the Cubs come to bat in the bottom of the first inning of a scoreless game. You remember that memorable moment last night here at the Tokyo Dome, provided by and provided for a youngster here in attendance. And that little fella's adopted hero from a land far, far away, Mike Piazza, homered in the eighth inning. And for one shining moment, forgotten was the debate as to why the baseball season started in Japan. One time, perhaps the only time, a cynic may say to himself, why not start the season in Japan? Oh, the joy, the 
innocence only the smile of a child can give us all that was a wonderful moment last night well anybody that's a baseball fan has had their hero or the guy you want to see come up with the big base hit to win a game or hit a home run and to watch that young man rooting for his idol Mike Piazza and to see Mike Piazza come through and just the emotions of that moment it made the whole trip worthwhile Rick Reed to face the Chicago Cubs. Five three winners here last night. Let's look at Don Baylor's lineup tonight. Eric Young to lead it off at second base. Damon Buford in center field. Sammy Sosa. Boy, you know the crowd wants to see him play long ball in this series. He's in right. Mark Grace. Shane Andrews is at third. Jeff Houston gets an odd at shortstop. Joe Girardi behind the plate. Farnsworth on the mound. And the man they'll be facing, right-hander Rick Reed. A lot of people have described Rick Reed as the poor man's Greg Maddox. He features a changeup, a slider. His best pitch, however, a cut fastball along with the sinking fastball. He'll use both pitches on both sides of the plate. Superb control. Basically, throughout his career, he's been a six-inning pitcher. Starts to show signs of wear and tear after about 90 pitches. The defense behind him, Todd Seal. Certainly a big question mark now. Moving over to first base, replacing Olerud. Alfonso at second. Ray Ordonia, spectacular at shortstop. A winner of three gold gloves and no errors in the last 101 games. We'll keep an eye on him as Young swings at the first pitch and pops it up. Alfonso drifts into shallow right. One pitch, one out for Rick Reed. Reed has been a fabulous pickup for the New York Mets. There's no two ways about it. A young man who, when he first came to professional baseball in 1988, made the jump from class A ball to the major leagues with the Pirates, but really was never given a chance, as you look at his numbers last year, to stay in the major leagues for any significant amount of time. The Mets got him as a six-year minor league free agent in 95. And the last three years, he has won 40 games for the Mets. He's perfectly suited to pitch in front of this Mets infield defense as well, Tom. A lot of movement on his fastball, whether it be the sinker or the cutter. Throws the ball over the plate, lets his defense work behind him. You saw the rather high hit total, 163 hits in 149 in the third innings. That's because he does throw the ball over the plate so often. Oh, and two to count, and a roller off the bat of Buford, and look at that. Ray Ordonez bent over to pick it up and rolled right into center field. It may have hit the seam, but we showed you a moment ago he's not committed an error in 101 games. That appeared that ball, you can see, came from the AstroTurf onto the dirt area out there at second base. It just stayed down underneath the glove. Normally, Ordonez would get down in the dirt there to make sure and scoop that ball. Maybe. A little lackadaisical, didn't get down far enough, allowed it to go through into center field. Zero errors in 101 games before tonight, a major league record for shortstops, and that is ruled an error on Ray Ordonez. The first time that has happened since June the 13th last season against Boston. So truly, the fans in Japan are seeing something that the folks in the States never see. <laughs> An error by Ray Ordonia. <laughs> Sammy had a good night at the plate last night. Two hits and three at bats. And Sosa also walked twice in the game. Of course, with the exchange rate, that's only one one hundredth of an error. <laughs> Oh, you're pretty quick with that exchange rate. Inside to Sosa, one and one. You've got that down now. Well, I don't know. Well, what I, is the latest exchange? Do you know? I didn't check the paper this morning. As I said last night, it's roughly 100 yen. Now, per open the paper, American it's 106 now. 106? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Mr. Wall Street. I don't read the financial pages, pal. <laughs> you might want to think about it. <laughs> one and one to Sosa. We talked about last night. Don Baylor plans on bringing aggressive baseball to the Windy City this summer. A lot of stealing, a lot of hitting and running, and try and generate runs. 1 1 to Sosa. Foul out of play. And you'll notice as Rick Reed holds Damon Buford on over there at first base. Todd Zeal tonight standing directly on the bag with a right handed pitcher on the mound. The Mets. 
play a more traditional defense over there at first base. You see D Zeal positioned inside the bag there to hold Buford. With the left-handed pitcher, we saw Zeal come way up in front, almost leading off the bag with the runner. Buford in limited playing time last season with Boston, stole nine bases. On the outside corner, strike three to Sosa, and he knew it. I called Rick Reed the poor man's Greg Maddox, and I meant that as the highest compliment. This time, a sinker that starts just off of the outside corner. Sammy gives up on the pitch. It tails right back over the outside corner for strike three. Maddox is able to do that so well. Throw the sinker on either side of the plate. Throw the cut fastball on either side of the plate. Really gives the hitter a lot of different looks with only two pitches. Race one of three in the game last night. Hit a solo home run in the eighth inning. He also lined to right, lined to center, was hit by a pitch and drew a walk. One hopper at Zeal, and that'll do it in the Chicago first inning. A rare error by Ray Ordonez, but Buford left it first. We move to the second in Tokyo, the Rapangi district. Friendly spent a lot of time there on his trip. Chip Carey will be taking over the play-by-play -play in the fourth inning. I know you're looking forward to that. We had a great time last night. Chip throwing it to Dutchie Carey, the wife of the late great Harry Carey for singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game in the seventh inning. We're going to go to Grand Central Station for the seventh inning today. So if you're getting ready to jump on the train and you got to pass through, Grand Central, Matt Lachlan is standing by there for the seventh inning stretch. Eric Young looks at a strike, one and one. Just about 6 a.m. in New York City, 5 a.m. in the Windy City. And 3 a.m. for those of you still up and at them out west. A high bouncer over the head of Ventura. An AstroTurf hit for Young with two down here in the third. Well, now we'll get a chance to keep an eye on Eric Young over there at first base as you get a look at this AstroTurf single. It's off that area out in front of home plate. Andrews was drawn well in, or rather, Ventura was drawn well in to protect against the butt. Young able to bounce that ball over his head. Young stole 51 bases last year. Perfect opportunity right here to see if he's going to challenge Mike Piazza behind the plate. Tony Womack, three straight years, has won the National League stolen base crown. Young would have been right there with him more than likely had it not been for an injury. Because Young was out of the gate and had a huge lead on Womack, who started last season on the disabled list. But then Young got hurt, and Womack went right by him. Now Damon Buford, it's ball one. And certainly this is a landmark date in Chicago Cubs history. March the 30th, back in 1992, the Cubs traded George Bell to the Chicago White Sox in exchange for left-handed pitcher Ken Patterson. And oh, by the way, some outfielder named Sammy Sosa. <laughs> Outside, 2-0. I think that was a pretty good deal. Not a bad deal. George Bell had a wonderful career, but he was definitely in the twilight of that career at the time. Sammy Sosa, just a skinny, strikeout prone, erratic outfielder at the time. Who would have guessed? 2 0. Oh, Young started, looked like he lost his footing, and then stopped over at first. And Damon Buford doing a nice job of what a two hitter should do in a potential steal situation. You see Eric Young, the crossover step. Felt like he didn't have a good jump. Hits the brakes and stays right there. But Buford taking pitches, giving Eric Young an opportunity to try to read that move. There goes Young. Got a great jump. It's ball four. Piazza would have had no chance. So now it's Sosa, who came to the Cubs eight years ago today. I recall it like it was yesterday. They made the trade. Sosa shows up. Probably didn't weigh more than 195 pounds at the time. Came in early to Hohokam Park in Mesa, Arizona. 
and was hitting seed after seed after seed. Sosa the year before in 91 with the White Sox barely hit 200 and had been sent back to the minor leagues. Two on, two out of a scoreless game, and Sosa waits. Strike one. Well, Reed definitely appeared distracted with Eric Young on the first base, throwing four consecutive balls to David Buford. He cannot afford to be distracted right now. All of his attention and concentration should be focused on that hitter at the plate. Young at second, Buford at first. Sosa high bouncer. Cut off by Ordonez, and he throws out Sammy at first. Terrific play by Ray Ordonez. If he doesn't get this ball, they may not get it out. But Ordonez cuts off Alfonso. The threat is over. Chip Carey will take things over in the fourth end of three in Tokyo. No score. So we go to the fourth inning, and Darrell Hamilton leads things off. He struck out swinging his first time up. The Mets with only one hit so far. The Cubs with only two through three innings. And a chopper over the glove of Andrews. Long throw for Houston. Not in time. Hamilton, good speed, beats it out. So there's the second New York hit. A turf bouncer for Hamilton. Well, we mentioned that the Mets don't have a lot of speed in their lineup, but Daryl Hamilton's certainly one of those guys that can still get down that line and just does beat Houston's throw to first base. Hamilton getting safely out of the batter's box. No slip, no fall. 90 feet through the bag and has himself an infield single. Well, let's not be deceived. I talked with Angel Hernandez a few moments ago about the conditions in the batter's box. Still very slippery. That clay hasn't firmed up as quickly as everyone would have hoped. But Hamilton with good hustle. Legs out a hit. And here's Edgardo Alfonso, who has the other Met hit on the night. Well, you can see as the hitters get in the box and kind of shuffle the dirt around there, it is very, very loose on the top. And between innings last night and also in the game tonight, the ground screw has come out and tried to tamp down that dirt, make it a little more solid, but so far not a lot of luck. You can see why players are wearing high-top shoes nowadays. <laughs> To get some of those long football cleats. Goodness gracious. I talked with Robin Ventura before the game. He said, maybe I ought to wear some of those garden aerating spikes. <laughs> yeah, Robin was the one hitter on the Mets that really had problems last night. Two times going all the way to the ground trying to get out of the batter's box. A ball and a strike. And Alfonso takes low. Two and one. Cubs really counting on this kid, Kyle Farnsworth, to solidify that rotation. If they can get Kerry Wood back, Ishmael Valdez, Kevin Tappany, John Lieber, and this guy, all of a sudden the Cubs have a very respectable rotation in the Central. We're a very impressive outing by Lieber last night. You had to come away from that game thinking that the Cubs have really found themselves something special. Guys like John Lieber aren't around very much in Major League Baseball anymore. The guys that are not afraid to throw the ball over the plate, let their defense work behind them. It's a very workmanlike outing last night. Very impressive. Downstairs to Alfonso, three balls and a strike. You look at Lieber and you see that devastating slider that he throws. Nice low 90s fastball. He's Opie Taylor with an assassin's heart on that mound. <laughs> and you're right, Bobby, a real find for the Cubs last year. There is great news as well from the Cubs camp regarding Kerry Wood. Kevin Tampany and Ishmael Valdez. Kerry Wood threw yesterday in Arizona. His velocity between 93 and 98 miles per hour. Wow. He is throwing slider again. Farnsworth threw one there and he missed with it. And that's ball four. Two on, nobody out for the Mets in their best scoring opportunity of the game. But first things first, here's Mike Piazza with two on and nobody out. And there's a good live fastball. Piazza felt that he let a pitch get by that he would normally come out of his shoes swinging at right there. It gives you an idea of the kind of pop that Farnsworth has on that fastball. A very smooth, easy delivery. 
the ball really seems to jump on the hitter. Piazza bounced into a force play to end the New York first. And every time he steps anywhere near the batter's box, you'd think you're watching a ball game on a hot Midwestern night. All those fireflies popping in the stands. And those accolades tell you why. Everybody in the house wants to see Piazza make some more magic like he did last night. Seven consecutive Silver Slugger awards. For those of you that aren't familiar, that's for the best offensive player at each position. I don't think there's any question this guy is the best offensive player at his position in the National League. How long will he remain a catcher, though? You talked about that last night. There are many who say that to prolong his career, a move to first base is going to be inevitable. But I know you respect the fact that he wants to wear the tools of ignorance and be behind the plate day in and day out in New York. Not only that, Chip, but the fact that he, he's trying to improve on his game behind the plate. We talked about that earlier. John Stern spent a lot of time in spring training trying to refine some of Piazza's mechanics behind the plate, his throwing to second base. We'll get a look at some of those changes later in the game as it progresses. Uh, some of the fans out there may remember Bob Boone and the way he received the ball behind the plate. They're trying to get Piazza to do a little bit more of the Bob Boone style of catching. Two balls, two strikes to Piazza. There's no doubt about it, that is the most difficult position in baseball to play. You have to know your pitchers, the opponent's pitchers, the opponent's hitters. Then you factor in the squatting, the standing, and the punishment you take back there every single day. And then you look at the numbers Piazza has put up, and you see why he's so special. Stays alive, count two and two. Last night, speaking of special, Mike Piazza made it interesting for the Mets with a two run bomb. It's not unusual for a major league hitter to strike a home run and stand at home plate and watch it, but very few major leaguers can hit home runs to the opposite field and stand at home plate and watch them the way Mike Piazza can. Is there a player, Bobby, that gets more leverage with an at bat? Then Mike Piazza? If, if it is, he must be playing in the Japanese major leagues because I haven't seen anybody generate the kind of power that Mike Piazza. Just, I mean, scary power. You see the numbers, the only player in the majors with a 300 average, 30 homers, 100 RBIs, four years in a row. Tremendous numbers. Tremendously strong upper body. Seems like he uses a bat that's about 40 inches long. He gets right down on the knob of the bat and, as you said, just generates tremendous leverage. And power against power continues in this Farnsworth Piazza confrontation. Two balls, two strikes. No one has scratched in game two in Tokyo. The Mets trying to salvage a split. The Cubs trying to shock the world and sweep the series in Japan would be their best start since 1995 when they won their first couple games of the season. Again the 2-2 with Hamilton and Alfonso aboard. Piazza breaks his back and Houston takes care of him for out number one. How about Farnsworth? He is challenging the heart of this New York order and we asked him is that the kind of pitcher you are? Probably a power pitcher. I mean, I throw 93, 96, 97, so I'm not I'm afraid to do anything. I mean, no one, I mean, Barry Bonds in the box, I'm knocking down. I mean, if you have to, because I got to make a living myself. I mean, you got to pitch inside to, you know, have a living in this game, so I mean, I'm not afraid, really afraid. I made this one go after. Him. That's something that not enough veteran pitchers in the game do pitch inside, and if you're not afraid to throw your fastball inside to Mike Piazza, you've got a pretty good chance to make a living in this game. Robin Ventura stands in now, and here's a look at that bat shattering Farnsworth fastball. This is the two seam fastball. You'll see it run in a little bit. You see Girardi reaching towards the inside part of the plate, got right in on the hands of Mike Piazza, which is where I feel you have to pitch Mike Piazza. One ball, no strikes to Ventura, and he hits it a mile high down the right field line. Playable for Sosa, late break, foul ground. He's got it. There's out number two, no tag by Hamilton or Alfonso. And how about Kyle Farnsworth, two on, nobody out, breaks Piazza's bat and pops up Robin Ventura. A couple of tough cookies. You see Sammy chasing this foul ball down. One of the things that the Japanese fans really react to 
is the throwing arms of the American outfielders. Sammy Sosa tonight, Henry Rodriguez last night. I mean, there wasn't even a play after the catch down in foul territory, but the fans were ooing and aahing watching Sammy uncork that throw back to the infield. Well, here's a man that the Mets are really counting on to produce offensively and defensively for Bobby Valentine this year. Derek Bell did not have a very good year last year with the Astros, but when he's right, he's a terrific offensive player. He's a great cap hitter, line drives from foul line to foul line. We mentioned during his last at bat, he flied to right field. It appeared his head dropped just a little bit at contact. We'll keep an eye on it this at bat. Farnsworth pops him up, and it's straight back and out of play for strike one. Again, he challenges Bell. And once again, the ball popped into the air. Bell hitting the bottom half of the ball. Let's take a look. Let's we'll just even draw a line under his chin there. See if his head drops down under that line as he approaches the ball. So far, so good. The front foot comes down. Look how far his head drops down below level. That causes the bat head to come down underneath the ball. You hit the bottom half and pop the ball in the air. Well, Farnsworth's gotten two pop-ups in the inning. He'd love another one here. One ball, one strike to Derek Bell. It looks like he needs to put on a little weight. That <laughs> uniform's a little large on Derek. But you know, Derek, in the summertime, you don't wear long sleeves. Good cut that time by Derek Bell. You know, I bet before the summer's over, Derek Bell will get nipped by an inside pitch on that baggy uniform. Once again, let's take a look this time, see if that head stays level. Striding into the ball, he drops down below the line once again. He dropped even farther on that swing. Still at the bottom half of the ball, a better swing, a more level swing, but the head's still dropping down. He's not hitting the center of the baseball. Tough One job for Tom strikes, Robinson, yeah. for, for any hitting instructor in the major leagues. You've got 15 players to work with. Each have their own idiosyncrasies at the plate. And how about Kyle Farnsworth, Bobby? Two on, nobody out. Two pop-ups and a called strike three. And the heart of the men order is retired in the fourth. Beautiful night for baseball in Tokyo, and we are scoreless. Well, Bobby, baseball truly becoming an international game. The first Japanese native to play in the major leagues was Masanori Murakami, who threw out the first pitch for tonight's ball game. 54 games with the San Francisco Giants, but he's not the only Japanese to make it to the big leagues. There he is in his prime. Most of them, all of them, in fact, pitchers. Masato Yoshi. Korsadeki Arabu. Shigatoshi Hasegawa and of course Hideo Nomo and you see what is happening in baseball it truly is going global 17 countries were on major league rosters last year most of them from the Dominican Republic and Bobby I think we're really starting to move in baseball toward a true international draft and perhaps someday maybe even in our lifetimes a true World Series it wouldn't be surprising Chip so many American players after they finish their playing careers uh, going to Australia to coach going to Greece Italy here in Japan uh, baseball really is spreading out around the globe and let's face it we're always looking for new talent yes indeed especially on those mounds I mean I'll tell you I mean, if there was a good pitcher at the North Pole the scout <laughs> would be up there looking at it Two balls, no strikes to Todd Zeal, leading off the New York fifth. That's the visiting team tonight. They were the home team last night, and the Cubs beat them 5-3 here in Tokyo. Farnsworth falls behind Zeal, 3-0. Farnsworth will throw a lot of pitches. That's normal for a power pitcher and a young one especially. And on four straight, Zeal is aboard, leading off the fifth. An interesting night for Ray Ordonez, who stands in now. His first error in a long, long time. And I'm sure after the ball game, he will say that's a, a play he should have made. His teammates certainly appreciate how long he has gone without an error, but he comes right back and makes a couple of sparkling defensive plays to bail out his pitcher. See Rick Reed right there to greet him. 101 games without an error for Odonias, and he'll have to start another streak when they open up against the Padres. 
What a player he is. He's bounced out in tonight's ball game. And Farnsworth struggling with that control misses with ball one. Age old question, not just in baseball, Bobby, but any sport. Would you rather have a good offensive team or a good defensive team? The, the emphasis, uh, at least in the last few years, certainly has shifted to the offensive side. But being a former catcher and believing the old axiom about being strong up the middle, I like to see good defense. It sure takes a lot of pressure off of your offense when you know you're going to stop another team from scoring more than three. You just have to score three or four to win. And it gives your pitching staff a lot of confidence as well. They're not afraid to throw the ball over the plate and allow the other team to put the ball in play because you got a pretty good chance for one of your guys to make a play behind you. I mean, this Mets pitching staff, uh, they have to thank their lucky stars oh, every time they take the mound and turn around and see all the gold glovers aligned behind them or potential gold glovers. I mean, that has to make a pitcher's job considerably easier, knowing that there's guys behind you that are going to make the plays. Two balls, no strikes to the number eight hitter, Ray Ordonez, here in the New York fifth. The 73rd Farnsworth pitch of the night bends over for strike one. You can see why in New York. 197 games last year just 68 errors and 20 unearned runs as a team ridiculously impressive numbers for New York three balls and a strike Farnsworth pitching himself into a whale of trouble here the Phillies last year were second in errors committed in the National League and they committed 32 more than New York. Full count now, three and two. The pitcher Rick Reed waits on deck and what's good. Brilliantly pitched ball game by both right-handers tonight. by Zeal he's running the pitch is low ball four. Third walk of the game for Farnsworth again for New York two on nobody out but trouble is lurking Reed Henderson and Hamilton are coming up next. Well, Reed certainly will be asked to put down a sacrifice bunt right here definitely want to keep the ball away from Mark Grace and it may be tough to deaden that ball on this artificial turf for Rick Reed. It won't be tough to deaden it if he hits it in the dirt, though. It might plug. Cups that time used the wheel play. Shane Andrews charged as well as Mark Grace. Both corner infielders coming in hard to field the bunt. Cups trying to get the force play at third base as Oster, Oscar Acosta. Pitching coach goes out to settle down the young right-hander. Control has left him here for a little bit in the fifth inning. And that is the ultimate bird's eye view of the pitcher's mound here at the Tokyo Dome. Like bacteria under a microscope. Thing. Yes, very good. It did. Only two hits allowed by Kyle Farnsworth, but he has walked three, two of them in this fifth inning for New York. Zeal at second, Ordonez at first. The Cubs pinch in at the corners with Reed in the box. And again, Farnsworth falls behind, and he has done that all night long for the Cubs. And that time, the Cubs playing a more traditional bunt defense. Andrews waiting to see if the ball was bunted down the third baseline and whether his pitcher could field the ball or not. With Zeal a slow runner at second base, I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see the Cubs go back to the wheel play to try to get that lead runner at third base. It was on. Farnsworth, though, spun as if to attempt to pick off play at second so he helped tip the hand defensively on that sequence well, many times the opposition's base runners will tell you what bunt defense you want to try to employ and once again with zeal's lack of speed at second base maybe an opportunity for the cubs to try to get that lead runner golden opportunity for new york reed lays down a dandy and andrews will flip to first perfect sacrifice bunt in a close game Fundamentals are key, and Reed gets the bunt down. Runners second, third, one out, and the top of the New York order coming up. 
in, you'll see Shane Andrews staying back, waiting to see whether Farnsworth can field the ball or not. Nobody covering third base at this point, so Shane Andrews comes in, calls off his pitcher, goes ahead and takes the sure out over at first base. Well, we've called him the poor man's Greg Maddox several times in this broadcast, and once again, Rick Reed does something to help himself win a ball game. Advancing runners into scoring position for Ricky Henderson in the top of the order. Henderson 0 for 2 has bounced to third and popped out. Farnsworth would love to have one of those plays in this situation. And Ricky pops it up right side. Grace gives chase. Girardi on the run, but it's well into the crowd. For strike one. Shane Andrews even with the bag at third. Mark Grace the same way over at first. They play halfway with Jeff Houston at shortstop. And once again, the speed of the runners at third base will determine where you position your infielders. A speedy runner at third base, Don Baylor may choose to bring the infield all the way in. A slower runner at third base, you can play them halfway. Give those middle infielders a little better range. This is not a good situation to be in defensively with a blindingly fast runner in Henderson in the box. He can bunt the ball. He can bounce it off the turf. And of course, you know, he's got plenty of pop, too. But he's in a quick 0-2 hole. Tremendous movement on this pitch from Farns, where the bottom just drops out of that ball. Looked like a strike for about 56 feet, and then where did it go? Second and third, only one out for New York. Now, through the early going of this game, Farnsworth was throwing a lot of four-seam fastballs up high in the strike zone. Here in the fifth inning, relying a little more on that two-seamer. A lot of movement, cutting the ball back in on the right-handed hitters. Well, he broke Piazza's bat in the fourth inning with that cutter. Still plenty of life on that heater, but he misses high two and two. If I make it to 42, I hope I'm as, in as good a shape as Ricky Henderson. <laughs> Look at this guy. Two balls, two strikes to the Mets leadoff man. Good rip. You know, there have been many players in baseball history that have played into their 40s, but I don't know of any of them that look exactly the same as they did the day they walked onto a major well, league. Well, you field. did. Well, myself accepted. <laughs> Look at this guy. He looks just like he did when he was a rookie with the Oakland Athletics. And some milestones certainly within reach for Ricky Henderson in the next couple of years. It may take a couple years to reach Ty Cobb's record, but the walks are definitely within reach this year. Two balls, two strikes. Mets threatening in the fifth. Some power in the game last night, some power pitching in the game tonight. 2-2. Two -two. There's a drive. Belted down the left field line, but he hooked it foul and out of play. Never before has there been this combination of power and speed in the leadoff spot in Major League Baseball. Well, we've seen Barnes were throwing that two-seam fastball as you see Ricky applying a little body English as Joe Girardi does the same thing behind him. Farnsworth trying to bury that two-seam fastball inside on Ricky Henderson. Went to the well perhaps once too often, and fortunately for him, Ricky pulled it foul. What a matchup. 2-2 two -two again. And again, it's popped up. A grizzled old veteran. Ricky Henderson against the raw boned young right hander Kyle Farnsworth in the fifth inning of a scoreless game in Tokyo. The pitch. Line drive hammered straight away center. That's going to be deep enough. Damon Buford puts it away. Todd Zeal scampers home, and the Mets have the first run of the game. Sacrifice fly, RBI for Ricky Henderson, and those leadoff walks come back to haunt Farnsworth. It's one to nothing, New York. 
Outstanding at bat by Ricky Henderson, fouling off some tough pitches, getting quicker as the at bat went on. This was a sinker that was supposed to get in on the hands. Farnsworth caught too much plate. Ricky knows that's enough to drive in Zeal. Buford's throw to third base well off the mark, allowing Ordonez to advance to third base. So Todd Zeal scores his first run as a Met. Ricky Henderson drives home his first run of the year. New York in front by one, and here's Hamilton, who leg down an infield hit his last time up. Speed in for a strike, one and one the count. Now one and two. Farnsworth creeping up toward 90 pitches. He is a very, very strong young man. There you see the pitch count for. Farnsworth in this ball game, no kind of limitations tonight. He can go as long as he's effective. Took something off, and Hamilton missed it by a foot. Two leadoff walks in the fifth, and a Ricky Ederson sacrifice fly scores the only run of the game. It's New York one, comes nothing. Joe Girardi leads it off for the Cubs in the fifth. He bounced out his first time up and wails at the first pitch and pops it out of play. We're going to take a look at Mike Piazza this inning. We mentioned he's been working hard with John Stern. See how his left elbow is outside of the left knee. He's got this knee bowed in. That's much like Bob Boone used to catch in his days with the Philadelphia Phillies, bowing those two knees in together. They said he had a lot of problems with that left knee last year. Girardi bounces that through the hole on the left side for a leadoff hit for the Cubs in the fifth inning. Girardi did not have a real good year with the bat last year for New York, but already, Bobby, four hits in two games for the Cubs. I think Joe Girardi realizes his importance to this Cubs ball club this year. A veteran player that knows how the game is supposed to be played. Very solid, fundamental player. We talked about it last night. Almost like having a coach on the field. Well, here's a chance for Farnsworth to help himself now. Everybody in the ballpark should be expecting a bunt. We'll see if Kyle can get one down, as you saw. Not a real good hitter. Not a good hitter, but he can't get a butt down. One nothing New York. They scored their run without a hit in the top of the fifth. Farnsworth punts it sharply. Zeal's going to second. Throws it into center field. Girardi on his way to third. Todd Zeal took a chance and aired badly and the Cubs in business in the fifth first and third with nobody out and I'll bet they wish they had John Olroot on that play. Well Seal worked very hard with Hernandez Keith Hernandez rather in spring training. You'll see him charging this ball aggressively. He's going to second base all the way the reverse spin move the throw to second pulls Ordonez off the bag. Girardi sliding in hard. We showed you some video last night of Todd Seal working hard with Keith Hernandez in spring training. Keith Hernandez is one of the more aggressive defensive first basemen in the history of the game. Perhaps Seal a little overly aggressive that time. Eric Young fouls the pitch away. So Todd Seal making the move from third to first, trying to pick up the nuances from one of the best glove men in the history of the game at first, slick fielding Keith Hernandez. Well, it was tough to get a ball by Keith Hernandez, always able to make the play, very aware of where he was on the field at all times, and this was down in Florida in spring training. 11-time gold glover Keith Hernandez working with the Mets' new first baseman, Todd Zeal. Well, third base in baseball is the hot corner. First base is the hot corner for Todd Zeal this year because the inevitable comparisons to the man who he is replacing, John Olroot. He now plays in Seattle. Two balls and a strike to Eric Young. Cubs have him first and third with nobody out. Well, no question, John Olroot was a very good first baseman, picking pros out of the dirt, making plays when the ball was hit his direction, but he was a very passive first baseman on bunt plays. 
And as we saw right there, Todd Zeal was not passive, tried to be very aggressive to get the lead runner, but perhaps the aggressiveness uh, ill-placed on that play. Young, double play ball. Four, six, and three. Tying run scores, though. Joe Girardi from third on the play. No RBI for Young, and it's a new game for the Cubs. 1-1 is our score. And does he look comfortable yet to you over at first base? Well, not really, and he will get comfortable as the season goes on. Watch the tail end of this play. Zeal was spiked on a play at first base last night. That throw nearly pulls him up high off the bag, but he's able to keep that right toe on, and then you see him dancing off that bag to get out of the way of that runner coming down the line. So base is empty. Two outs now for Damon Buford, who reached on the Ray Ordonez air, also has walked. And he's sporting a new piece of lumber tonight, the bat he used to pick up the hit here in Japan last night to open up the game. On its way to Cooperstown. Ordonez charges. Ball finds long. Leather Larson and Buford retired. Boy, the more you see that guy play, the more impressed you are. Cubs get a leadoff Girardi hit, a sacrifice, a zeal error, and a double play has tied the game for the Cubs in the fifth. It's 1-1 after five in Tokyo. Kyle Farnsworth and Rick Reed in a real dandy duel at the Big Egg, the Tokyo Dome. Quarter to seven Eastern time in the morning in the East Coast. And you are seeing a real treat with your breakfast bagel today. A 1-1 affair here in Japan. Alfonso leads things off. He's walked, he's single. And he leads off the sixth with ball one outside. One run, two hits, two New York errors. And that's real news. One run, four hits, an errorless game for Chicago. And the breaking ball dances over for strike one. Two balls and a strike to Edgardo Alfonso. We've been talking about Keith Hernandez, Bobby. He is at Grand Central Station in New York as we speak. And he will be a part of our seventh inning stretch festivities when Tom Brenneman joins us in the booth. Another walk. That's four for Farnsworth. And more trouble in the sixth inning for Chicago. Those leadoff walks really, really gray the hair of a manager, especially when you have a guy like this stepping up next. Well, leadoff walks are never a good idea to start an inning, but especially when Mike Piazza, Robin Ventura, and Derek Bell are waiting in the wings. You know those guys are capable of exploding at any moment in a ball game. You just do not want to put runners on base ahead of them. Well, what's Piazza thinking now? Farnsworth broke his bat with that two-seam riding fastball last time up. What's he looking for here? I think Mike Piazza consistently is looking for a ball out over the plate where he can extend his arms as he did last night and drive the ball. He's so strong, he doesn't have to pull the ball to get home runs or to find gaps. We saw that in batting practice the last couple of days. Oh, good breaking ball from Farnsworth. We saw it last night, too, when Piazza went the other way for that two-run home. Real good slider on the outside part of the plate here. You can see Piazza was made aware of that sinker inside. That front side opens up just a little bit. Takes a very weak swing and a breaking ball just off of the outside corner. 98 Farnsworth pitches to this point. Number 99, still over 90 miles an hour. He misses with it low, two and one. Piazza, then Ventura, then Derek Bell in a 1-1 sixth inning thriller. Well, you talked to the players before the game, as I know you did, I did as well. I don't know if we'll ever experience an opening day quite like what we saw yesterday and an opening series like the one we're a part of here in Japan. Foul pass Cookie Rojas, count evens two and two. To a man. 
the players have all said how much they have enjoyed this experience and all of us I'm sure have been so humbled and feel so grateful to the wonderful hosts the Japanese people for the kindness that they have shown us here in Japan this has been a wonderful treat and I hope we can come back sometime the pitch Piazza stays alive two and two. History made in Japan these past two days. And in talking with Bud Selig before the game today, there will be more teams coming to Tokyo, perhaps for opening day next year. Two balls, two strikes. Strike three call, blew the fastball by him. He couldn't pull the trigger. And Farnsworth has his fourth strike out of the game. And Chip, I feel that's a direct byproduct of the earlier at bat when he had his bat shattered. You see Piazza's front side comes open just a little bit. That left hip, watch the left hip open up, trying to clear the way in case Farnsworth comes back with that hard sinker on the inside corner. That pitch is perfectly placed on the outside corner. Piazza has no choice but to watch it go by. Great execution by Kyle Farnsworth, but how about the call by Joe Girardi? Behind the plate, here's Ventura, pop up left side, pretty deep. Henry Rodriguez gives Chase plenty of room. He's got it, two down. So Ventura pops out. He's 0 for 3 and 0 for 7 in the series. You made the point earlier, Joe Girardi is going to be a huge part of the puzzle for the Cubs this year. And that will take a while as well. We talked about Todd Zeal and how he will get better and he will feel better about situations as the season goes on. These Cubs pitchers need to get the trust in Joe Girardi to believe that he's going to put down the right fingers, call the right pitches in the right situations. Uh, there may be some rocky games during the early going of the season where they shake him off and end up paying the price for it. But ultimately, these pitchers will have confidence in Joe Girardi. Derek Bell digs in. Cuts it off. Streaking toward third is Alfonso. Good relay. It's a double for Bell. Runners second and third now two out. You talked about Bell being a terrific gap hitter when he's on. He splits the gap in right center, but the Cubs able to cut it off and keep the game tied. Well, Derek Bell, what I would call a slash hitter. Watch him slash this ball into right field. Down and away from him. Ball finds a gap in right center field. Edgardo Alfonso, the lead runner, taking his lead off. He sees that ball headed for the outfield with two outs, no reason to slow down. Takes a good cut at second base. But as you mentioned, a tremendous relay, getting the ball back in quickly to Eric Young. No chance for Cookie Rojas to even make an attempt to send the runner home. First extra base hit of this ball game, a double by Bell. And now Todd Zeal, a chance for redemption. And you know he's squeezing the sawdust out of the bat handle here. Farnsworth will work off the windup with two men down. And he hits Todd Zeal in the arm. So the Mets now have him loaded for Ray Ordonez. We heard Kyle Farnsworth say earlier in the game that he has to pitch inside. He doesn't mind pitching inside. Clips Todd Zeal on the back of the left arm right there to load the bases with two outs for Ray Ordonez. I think Todd Zeal minds that he tried to pitch inside on that particular sequence. I think so too. And that man Don Baylor knows a thing or two about what that feels like. <laughs> oh, it was 246 times. His family crest is a bruise. <laughs> and Baylor on his way out now to talk things over with Farnsworth. And from the looks of things, that might be it for Kyle. He's right around the 100 pitch mark. The Mets have the bases loaded, two outs in the sixth inning. Oh, what a lift for the Cubs if Kyle Farnsworth can pitch all season long like he pitched tonight. 105 pitches, only one run, three hits allowed. And now he gives way to Matt Karchner, who missed most of last year after pulling a groin muscle on the mound at Wrigley Field. No room to put Ordonez and Karchner misses with ball one high. The Cubs really counting on this guy to help get that ball to Rick Aguilera in the Chicago pen. Let's go, Let's go, 
Chopper toward third and foul. One ball, one strike. It comes acquired Karchner from the White Sox for a terrific looking young prospect named John Garland. They got him down the stretch in 98 when they were making their push for the wild card. But he's in a real tough spot against a real good clutch hitter and he almost untied the game by hitting Ordonez. Ordonez very much a free swinger up there at the plate but with the bases loaded he seems to be able to rise to the occasion. He's worked the count into his favor at two and one right here. Two and two. Fork ball right there from Karchner. Watch the bottom drop out of this pitch. Ordonez thinks fastball, fastball, fastball. Ooh. Big spot in this ball game. Two and two. Bases loaded. A high chopper over the mound. Karchner has it. Throws to first, and he gets Ordonez, and the Cubs escape a bases loaded jam in the sixth inning. On we go to the bottom half in Tokyo. Sammy Sosa will lead things off for the Cubs. We are still tied at one. Right in the heart of Midtown. Ricky Henderson looks at ball one. And we've talked about Keith Hernandez and his tutelage of Todd Zeal for the Mets at first base this year. And perhaps he will sing a little take me out to the ball game. Two balls and no strikes. Boy, he could sing a tune or two with that glove of his at first base. Eleven times he won the gold glove. Henderson chops it foul. Henderson had a marvelous at bat back in the fifth inning. With runners at second and third and only one out, he battled and battled and fouled away some tough pitches by Farnsworth and finally milked it into a sack fly to center field to give the Mets a one-run lead. Karchner turns it loose. Look out. High and tight. And Henderson, fortunate enough at 41 years old, to still get out of the way. Tremendous reaction here by Ricky Henderson. This ball not only at his head, but tailing in towards his head. I don't know how he got out of the way of that pitch. Wow. You have to be a tremendous athlete to avoid getting hit by that pitch. And Ricky Henderson, make no mistake about it, is a tremendous athlete. Three balls and a strike. And it's down low for ball four. So now the fun begins. Most 41-year-olds I know can't get out of the way of a fastball from their five-year-old son. Oh, my. Ricky gets to his feet. Thank you. <laughs> well, of course, you know, getting knocked on your can like Ricky was and then getting to first base and knowing that he's the all-time stolen base leader in a tie ball game in the seventh. I think maybe they better keep an eye on him. Darrell Hamilton has singled once in three at bats. He struck out twice. Henderson not going on the first pitch. It's a fastball strike one. Ball taken high and away. One ball and one strike. Part of the job of a good number two hitter in the major leagues is to take enough pitch to give those base stealers like Ricky Henderson an opportunity to pick a pitch to run on, get himself into scoring position. Go over to first and the runner back, Henderson, trying to join Ted Williams as the only two players in big league history to steal a base in four different decades. particularly quick with his delivery to home plate. He's a big guy, about six foot five, six six out there on the mound. It takes him a little while to unwind. Ricky just trying to time that delivery, get the best possible jump. Got a bigger lead this time. 
Oh, they caught him and just getting back is Henderson. Well, that same quickness we saw him use in the batter's box to avoid that neck high fastball comes into play again. Ricky leaning the wrong way. You'll see him open up and start to move towards second base. The throw comes back to first. Ricky just too quick gets back in underneath the tag. Two balls and a strike to Hamilton. And he looks at strike two, giving Henderson the chance to run. It's part of the tough job of being a number two hitter. Many times you're going to be hitting from deep into a hole. Hamilton's taken pitches all through this at bat. Four consecutive pitches, trying to allow Henderson an opportunity to time Karchner's delivery and get in the scoring position. Now he's on his own up there at the plate. to the screen it stays at two balls two strikes one one game here in the seventh one run three hits two errors seven men left on base for the Mets the Cubs one run four hits no errors and they've stranded five well, you see Dennis Cook left handed reliever for the Mets doing a little gardening in the bullpen they're even having trouble with the dirt on the bullpen mounds underneath the Tokyo Dome Either that or he's threatening to beat up on one of his teammates out there. <laughs> Tending your guard. And then they try to go away. I said, oh, I can't, I got to hit the motherfucker. <laughs> and another throw to first. I think Ricky has seen enough of Matt Karcher's delivery to home plate. He's got a pretty good idea of what to look for and make that break for second base. Not going and a line drive caught by Houston at shortstop. And Henderson able to get back to the bag. Not a smart play by Houston after making the catch. A terrific play by Grace kept Henderson from going all the way to third. And a tremendous ovation for the fans here at the Tokyo Dome. They really do appreciate good defensive plays and this is a great defensive play by Houston. He was cheating a little bit towards second base in the event that Henderson attempted a stolen base had to go back to his right dive and make the play an ill advised throw there back to first and a nice play by Grace on the other end to keep the ball in play. Two down Henderson still at first base. And here's Edgardo Alfonso he is singled and walked twice. Ball high and away. Want to know to Edgardo Alfonso who at 27 home runs, knocked in 108 last season for the Mets. Henderson, a hearty lead. There he goes. Pitch taken high. Throw to second base. Henderson safe at second base. Henderson, his first stolen base of the season. He stole the first one his career when Jimmy Carter was present. Picked a good pitch to run on a breaking ball, an off-speed pitch up high. Joe Girardi gets rid of the ball quickly. Look at that explosion into the dirt as Ricky Henderson accelerates into that head first slide. Right through the bag and off the bag. Was able to keep his toe on there long enough so Eric Young could not reach back and make a tag after he slid over the bag. 1,335 career stolen bases for Henderson. He's in scoring position with two away here in the seventh. Two and Odo Alfonso, and now a bluff throw back to second base. Good hitters count at 2 and 0, and a good 2 and 0 pitch on the inside corner for a called strike. Alfonso appears to be upset with himself for taking that pitch. Fastball on the inside part of the plate was perhaps looking for something out, a way that he could drive to the opposite field. Piazzo waits in the on deck circle. Henderson, the lead run at second. And now three and one. Parts are flirting with disaster here. Go, 
Kitchener worked out of a bases loaded jam in the sixth. The lead run at second in the seventh. And it's ball four, and here comes Mike Piazza. Odd sequence of pitches there for Karchner. Ended up walking Alfonso on a slider off the plate down low and away on the 3-1 count. I believe I'd rather take my chances with Edgardo Alfonso, as good a hitter as he is. I'd rather take my chances with him as you see left-hander Mark Guthrie throwing in the Cubs bullpen. And to have the man at the plate right now, Mike Piazza with two runners on base. Piazza, two hits, including a two-run home run last night. He's 0 for 3 tonight. 1-1 one, one game in the seventh. Two on and two out. Ball one down low. Crusher with a lot of movement on his fastball, but he's having trouble keeping it within the strike zone. He's missed high, he's missed inside. Girardi sets up inside, and Piazza fouls it back to the screen. It was that inside pitch from Farnsworth to jam Piazza in the fourth inning. And really a double whammy because it tied him up for a called third strike in the sixth. That's generally considered the way to attack Mike Piazza. Hard fastballs in on the hands above the belt and then try to get him to chase bad breaking balls out of the strike zone. But you better make sure you get it in there. Any ball left out over the plate, we know what he can do. We saw it last night. Henderson, the runner at second, over at first. Alfonso with two away in the New York seventh inning. Piazza had a good rip at that pitch and fouled it out of play. You can tell he's upset that he missed it. Yeah, that was a pitch he was looking for. A fastball pretty much over the heart of the plate. Joe Girardi was trying to get that ball inside for Matt Karchner. It's straight out over the fat part of the plate. Piazza only able to get a piece of it and foul it straight back. Girardi hanging his signs for Karchner, who's ahead one and two. And it's off the outside corner with another slider. They hit the count of one and two. They tried to lead Mike Piazza right out of the strike zone with that slider. Just too far outside. Two on, two out, two balls, two strikes, and a one-hop pickup by Houston. The force in the inning is over. Piazza hit it on the nose. Two great plays in the inning by the Cubs shortstop. 1-1 one, one game as we head for the bottom half of the eighth inning. And while we have a moment, let me understand that our blimp camera is just flying high above Tokyo just outside the Tokyo Dome. First time we've been able to bring this to you through the first two games of this series. Our blimp cam. And let's take a look at it. Boy, it's such a wonderful... The, the depth that we sink to. What was that, a lizard on steroids? Oh. Damon Buford is 0 for 2, has been on base twice, reached on an error and drawn a walk. Ordonez won't boot the ground ball by Buford this time as he did in the first inning, one away. So a 1-1 game here in the bottom of the eighth inning, and here's a man that can make it 2-1 Cubs in a hurry. Sammy, a couple base hits in the ball game last night, including a double down the left field line, but you know he's got one thing on his mind right now in this at bat against Rick Reed, and that's the same thing the fans here at the Tokyo Dome are dying to see. March 30th, 1992, eight years ago today, Sosa traded from the White Sox to the Cubs. He has since hit 307 home runs, and he looks at a strike. Rick Aguilera warming up at the Cubs bullpen. So 
Sosa, 66 homers in 98, 63 last year. And he fouls it back. He had a hearty cut. Reed ahead at 0 and 2. Boy, it's amazing. Sosa, the possessor of the second highest and fourth highest single season home run totals in Major League history. And in neither season, of course, did he win the home run crown in his own league. Among Sammy's home runs last year, number 38 came against Rick Reed, as you see most home runs with the Chicago Cubs. Ernie Banks atop the list. Banks and Williams Hall of Famers. Santos should be. Sosa's on his way. Line drive into right field. Bell will get it. The inning is over. Sosa hit it hard, but it's a perfect eighth for Reed. We go to the ninth in Tokyo, still tied at one. Taking over on the mound. He looked sharp last night. Left hander John Franco. So here we go in the bottom of the ninth. It'll be Grace Rodriguez and Andrews against John Franco. Jam shot pop up. Alfonso's not going to get it. Another flare for Grace. He has two of those tonight for base hits. And those hands are buzzing. Uh, you know he's going to take it. I'll tell you, good hitters seem to find a way to dunk that ball out there where nobody's playing. Gets jammed with that ball, able to fight it off, muscle it over the head of Alfonso just in front of Daryl Hamilton in center field. Grace on to lead off the bottom of the ninth inning here for the Cubs. Now Henry Rodriguez, you don't figure in a million years this guy to butt. over to first and a high throw play made by Zeal and once again the Mets with a left handed pitcher on the mound have Todd Zeal positioned in front of the runner I asked Dave Wallace do they have a designated sign so that the first baseman knows when the pitcher is throwing over he said that the first baseman has to read the move just like the runner does doubly tough for Todd Zeal learning a new position learning a new pitching staff and their moves to first base and again, Zeal until last night had not started a game at first base since 1996. Ball one to Rodriguez, swing and a miss. Many have felt through the years that left-handers actually hit Franco better than right-handed bats. Well, Franco's best pitch is that change-up screwball, a pitch that's very effective and fades down and away from a right-handed hitter. His third best pitch is his breaking ball, the pitch he figures to use against left-handed hitters. Good fastball there from Franco. Paints the outside corner. One ball, two strikes. Grace, a leadoff single here in the Chicago ninth inning. He represents the winning run. Catches Henry Rodriguez guessing something else here on the two strike count. Fastball outer half of the plate. Ron Franco challenging the left hander there with a fastball. Boy, Franco, this guy is still mighty tough. Here's Shane Andrews. 0 for 3 is struck out twice after driving in three runs last night. He shoots it into right field, down near the line, foul ball. Cubs batting, and a good morning to those of you back in the United States, 8 o'clock in the morning. Back in New York City, Tom Brenneman, Bob Brenly, Chip Carey, and our entire Fox Sports Net crew. Last night, the Cubs won the season opener by a final count of 5-3. Pitchers duel tonight. The teams have combined to score two runs on a total of eight hits. And one of the runs that scored, the Cubs only run in the fifth, an unearned run against Rick Reed. Mark Grace has started the ninth with a single. 
One out later, it's Andrews, and the 0-1 pitch is strike two. Cole Liniak is moved into the on-deck circle. Jeff Hewson due up. Nothing in two. The count on Andrews, and Franco turns it loose. Tried the inside corner a little too far in. As a right-handed hitter, you're so aware of that screwball fading down and away from you as a right-handed hitter. John Franco not overpowering by any stretch of the imagination. He may hit 90 on occasion with his fastball, but... So many off-speed pitches that that fastball looks much, much quicker than it really is. One and two. Off the outside corner this time with what looked like a screwball. He throws a couple of different ones. One he will throw very hard and tailing down away almost like a sinker. And another one that he'll use more as a changeup that you can really see fading away from the right-handers. This guy doesn't throw a screwball. Armando Benitez, flame-throwing closer for the Mets. The big nasty they call his heat. And a 2-2. Down and in. So Franco ahead of Andrews 0-2 has now missed on three straight. Do you start Mark Grace with Andrews at the plate here in the bottom of the ninth? Well, normally you would, but Andrews is a definite strikeout candidate right here. He's been much of a, very much of a free swinger throughout his career. We talked that they're trying to get him to make more contact. I think you have to play it safe right here. Let Andrews pick a pitch to swing at. Keep Grace right there at first base. Grace getting a big lead over there. Just moving step for step with Zeal. Three balls, two strikes. Franco, the runner goes, and it's foul out of play. A late start by Grace as that one will reach the seats. I think that's why I would not run Mark Grace. Also, Shane Andrews, a strikeout candidate. Grace is not a fast runner. He's not getting a great jump out there. The defense that the Mets are employing with Todd Zeal jockeying back and forth in front of the runner has filled Mark Grace with a lot of uncertainty over there. He's not getting a great jump, and he does not have good speed. Grace in 161 games last year only stole three bases. We'll see if he's running again. Three and two with one out. Andrews waits. Franco a look over, and the runner going is inside ball four. So Franco, who is ahead of Andrews at 0-2, walks him, and the winning run is at second base. Well, in the event of a base hit to the outfield, Melvin Moore, who just recently entered the game, a tremendous throwing arm in left field. Darrell Hamilton, very average arm in center, but he does charge the ball very, very well. Derek Bell, an outstanding arm, however, very erratic in right field. Made a nice throw to the plate last night to cut down Sammy Sosa. So now Liniak batting for Houston with a winning run at second with one away here in the ninth inning. And he swings at the first pitch and he's down a strike by fouling it off. Really the only reason Liniak is here is because of the injuries to two of the veterans that were really and are key components to this Cub team this season. Willie Green, their backup third baseman, a left-handed batter, and their fourth outfield, the versatile Glenn Allen Hill, both injured during spring training. So Liniak may get a chance to stay for a while if he comes through right here. He hits that one foul and out of play first base side 0-2. John Franco gets ahead in the count 0 and 2. He becomes a much more dangerous pitcher. He's able to use that screwball out of the strike zone, push right handed hitters off the plate with that fastball. It would be a bit surprising to see this count go to 3 and 2 if Liniak can lay off some of those tough pitches. I would really doubt if Franco is going to throw him a strike the next couple pitches. Well, that's what Andrews did, and he drew a walk after falling behind 0 and 2. Franco comes after him, and Liniak gone swinging second out here in the night. That pitch that appeared to be down out of the strike zone. Take advantage of that hitter's aggressiveness. He's got to protect the plate with two strikes. Look at the bottom fall out of that change up screwball just off the outside corner and almost into the dirt. So now it'll be Joe Girardi originally signed by the Cubs out of Northwestern University. 
He moved on to Colorado, won three World Series rings with the New York Yankees, and now he faces the native New Yorker in John Franco. Winning run at second base, two away. Swing and a miss, strike one. Ray started the inning with a single. An out later, Andrews drew a walk. And now with two gone, it's Girardi with a chance to win the game for Chicago. Race does not run well at second, and Bobby told you about the outfield arms. 0-1 pitch. Roller up the third baseline, foul. Third straight hitter, Franco's jumped in front, 0-2. Once again on the 0-2 count, look for John Franco to throw something tantalizingly near the strike zone, but not really a good pitch to hit. He got Liniac to chase a bad pitch down out of the zone. Joe Girardi, very much a free swinger, could be susceptible to the same kind of pitch. There you get a look at the only man that matters, Mark Grace. The lead runner, the potential winning run here in the bottom of the ninth inning. Will we go to the tenth or do the Cubs win it here in the ninth? Piazza the sign sets up away. And it missed away. The runners at second base can peek into the glove of John Franco and see when he goes to that changeup grip. However, Franco over the past few seasons, he knows that. He knows the runners at second can see in the glove. He will put the change-up grip on the ball and change to the fastball as he delivers the ball to home plate. Very tough to relay to the hitter what's coming. Fastball missed inside, even the count to Girardi. Bobby Valentine in the Mets hoping to force extra frames here tonight. Race would like nothing more. And to score the winning run here in the bottom of the ninth inning. Race not even peeking in. Another change up here. Just off the outside corner. Well, of course, the problem at three and two is now the runners get started. So on a base hit to the outfield, it really hurts your outfielder's chances of throwing anybody out of the plate. Race the winning run at second. Two down, last of the ninth, 1-1 game. John Franco against Joe Girardi. Three balls, two strikes. And a bluff throw to second. Team scored in their halves of the fifth. Franco trying to strand Grace right there at second base. Change up once again. And a roller off the end of the bat down to Zeal. We're headed for the 10th inning. Our first extra inning game of the 2000 season. The Cubs leave two. They've stranded seven on the night. And at the end of nine in Tokyo, the Mets and the Cubs deadlocked at one. Bottom half of the 10th inning, the Cubs coming to bat against a new pitcher, Turk Wendell. Of course, when you think that a home run ball could win this game, the two names that come to mind immediately, both in the States and here in Japan, Henry Aaron and the great Sadaharu O. They squared off in a home run hitting contest in 1974. Oh, the left-handed swinger who in his career hit 868 home runs, 113 more than Aaron. But he didn't hit more than Hammer and Hank on this day. Aaron won it 10-9. Here you see the career batting records. Major League Baseball, Japan Major League's comparison. Hank Aaron, the home run leader. Sadaharo, we just mentioned, hits Pete Rose. This is Al Haramoto, 3,085 hits for the Japanese big leaguers. Cal Ripken's consecutive game streak will stand anywhere. Yes, indeed. Jeff Reed will bat to begin things against Turk Wendell here in the 10th inning. Uh, Wendell, another outstanding season for the Mets out of their pen in 99, worked in 80 games. 
So Reed went eight, Franco went one, and now it's Wendell. There's strike two. Sixteen years in the major leagues for Jeff Reed. He's one of those guys that's always in demand, a left-handed hitting catcher, and I believe he has gotten better defensively as his career has gone on. 0-2 delivery, and it's down and in. You know, one footnote on Sadaharu O. Oh, he did have the advantage of smaller ballparks, a smaller ball, and lesser pitching. But he had 9,200 fewer at bats, 3,100 fewer rather than Aaron. And given Aaron's at bats, O's lifetime total conceivably could have been 1,150 career home runs. It's hard to make a comparison like that. Uh, obviously, two completely different situations. Apples and oranges, both very good hitters. One two pitch, and it's fouled out of play. Well, Cleet Boyer, a former Yankee third baseman who played and coached in Japan for many years, said, Oh, had the strength of Hank Aaron and the eyes of Ted Williams. Not a bad comparison there. <laughs> with a foul ball and behind an account at one and two and he fouls that one straight back out of play another souvenir for more on that story let's go to Chip Carey okay Tommy thanks a lot the Cubs are the home team in this ball game here in Tokyo they've gone through nine dozen baseballs already and the Cubs equipment manager Tom Hellman is rubbing them up as we battle on here <laughs> Tom Hellman affectionately known as Otis busy at work Trying to get more baseballs ready as we march on to the bottom of the 10th inning here in Tokyo. Two and two now to Reed. He'll be followed by Young and then Damon Buford. Playing slightly to pull is Hamilton. Or rather Mora now who has moved into center field. Chop foul. Jay Payton has stayed in the game to play left. He batted for Hamilton, and Mora moves from left field to center field. There you get a look at Payton. Now in left, and Mora in center. Hammered down the right field line, foul. Jeffrey throughout his career has always had a tremendous eye at the plate just because he's behind in the count two strikes he's able to battle foul off the tough pitches take the ones that are out of the strike zone two and two to Reed just off the outside corner Wendell wanted the call didn't get it Bobby Valentine in the Mets Hoping to extend this game to the 11th inning. And there's ball four, and Wendell can't believe that one was called a ball by Angel Hernandez. A slider that started just out of the strike zone, appeared to be up high a little bit. Take another look at it here. I mentioned Reed with a great eye at the plate. Mm. Which appeared to maybe nip the outside corner, perhaps called high by home plate umpire Angel Hernandez. Jeff Reed has done his job, find a way to reach base here in extra innings, and he'll give way to a pinch runner. Tarek Brock. Brock on to run for Reed. And yes, the Cubs are carrying a third catcher should they need to go that route. Girardi's still in the game right now. Izzy Molina, and that one butted beautifully by Young. Piazza throws him out. For the second straight inning, the Cubs have the winning run at second base. Well, you can understand why Bobby Valentine is pacing around and going down to get a drink of water. Granted, it's only the second game out of a 162-game schedule. But you hate the thought, if you're Valentine and the Mets, of starting the year 0-2 against a team you're supposed to beat. Especially with expectations the way they are with Mets fans back in the Big Apple. 
This is supposed to be the year the Mets make big noise in the postseason and to start the year 0-2 against a on paper inferior team would certainly have a lot of people scratching their heads back in New York. Brock the winning run at second and Damon Buford the batter. He looks at a strike. Slider on the outside corner from Wendell. Sammy Sosa hoping for a chance on deck. Of course it'd be A-OK -okay by Sammy to say no problem. We'll wait until we get back to the States for me to bat again. Popped up behind the plate. Piazza with room. Two down in the inning and Sosa will hit. Why not walk Sammy Sosa here with first base open two outs in the inning but I feel Turk Wendell with that nasty slider that he features has a better chance of retiring Sammy Sosa than the contact hitter Mark Grace a left hander waiting in the on deck circle. Although Mike Piazza's got the arm up they're going to walk him. Wow this is a surprise and some at home may be saying what do you mean surprise this is one of the premier sluggers in the game. Dennis Cook is ready in the bullpen, but you're right. You are just, oh, I guess pick your poison. I guess that's true, but over the course of his career, I've seen Mark Grace make this move backfire so many times against the opposition. Lefty righty makes no difference to Mark Grace. Dennis Cook is warmed up and ready to go for the Mets, and I'm sure we'll see him come on to face Mark Grace. So there's ball four to Sosa. Grace against left-handed pitching in his career, a 295 average. Against right-handed pitching, 307. A left-hander will be brought on. Dennis Cook from the bullpen. Bottom of the tenth, a 1-1 game. Bottom of the tenth inning, a 1-1 game between the Mets and the Cubs. Chicago with a winning run at second base, and now Dennis Cook. Appearing in his 500th major league game is brought on to face Mark Grace. And if you're wondering how has Mark Grace done against the left hander in his career, he's one for seven. Not many pitchers in the game have had those kind of numbers against Mark Grace. Two for three in the ball game tonight. Cook features a fastball that he'll cut, he'll sink it in on the lefties. Big breaking ball, also a changeup. He figures to use that breaking ball against Mark Grace in this situation. Cook was not sharp here in the game last night. He pitched an inning and a third. And gave up the two-run home run to Shane Andrews. So now it's Grace. One of the heroes for Chicago last night could be the hero in game two. Tarek Brock the winning run at second base with two away here in the bottom of the tenth inning. Grace waves about a couple of times and cook a check of the runners and now turns it loose. Fastball in 1-0 to Grace. Grace has delivered more big base hits as you mentioned Bobby for the Cubs over the last 12 years than just about any player they've had in fact than any player they've had 1 0 pitch fastball high and he has a count in his favor two balls no strikes and you're forced defensively to play Mark Grace straight up all the way around he's capable of hitting the ball from foul line to foul line he figures to give a little bit against the left handed pitcher probably looking to shoot a ball to that opposite field. 2-0 winning run. Brock at second takes his lead. 3-0. Grace faced the left-hander Franco in the ninth and had a single. Oh, it gets away from Dennis Cook. Chases Grace off the plate once again. 3-0. I wouldn't be surprised if Mark Grace has the green light here. He's got such a tremendous eye at the plate. We'll look for one pitch in one location. If it's not there, he'll take it. Three balls, no strikes to the Cub first baseman. And there's ball four. They're loaded for left-handed batting Henry Rodriguez. Boy, a 
funny game baseball. The Cubs bullpen much maligned. They have been unhittable, literally unhittable tonight. The Mets bullpen, one of the best in all the baseball, and they have had a rocky two days up until tonight. Although they've been in trouble a couple of innings tonight. Franco, now Wendell, and Dennis Cook. The winning run 90 feet away as Baylor and the Cubs try to go to 2-0. Rodriguez waits. Line foul. Cook coming into the ball game to face back to back lefties. Mark Grace was one for seven lifetime. Henry Rodriguez one for nine lifetime against Dennis Cook. Bottom of the tenth, winning run at third. Bases are loaded with two away. And Cook delivers. Oh, he pulled the string there. And Rodriguez way out in front. Nothing in two. That almost makes you wonder after that at bat, even though Cook had the numbers in his favor, if he really wanted any part of Grace. Well, he certainly didn't come close to the strike zone. And control has never been a big problem for Dennis Cook. I mean, he was missing. Up and in consistently on Mark Grace. Henry Rodriguez very much a free swinger, considerably much more a free swinger than Mark Grace. Cook dropped that big slow curveball in there ahead in the count now. I look for him to mess around the edges of the strike zone, trying to get the free swinger to chase a bad pitch. Now it falls on Mike Piazza to make sure that breaking ball doesn't get in the dirt and get by for a pass ball. Oh, two pitch to Rodriguez, and here it comes. Fastball just off that outside corner. One ball, two strikes. Cook and Rodriguez, two veterans, been around a long time. They square off here in Tokyo, Japan, in the bottom of the 10th inning with the bases loaded of a tie game. And a 1-2 delivery. Fastball, strike three, call. Dennis Cook in and slams the door on the Chicago rally. So Bobby Valentine rolls the dice and comes up lucky seven. We go to inning 11. Still tied at one. Top half of the 11th inning. Good morning to you back in America in our Fox Sports Net game summary. 1-1 at the end of 10. A total of eight hits by the two teams in the game. The only extra base hit came off the bat of Derek Bell. That was way back in the sixth inning. In fact, that's the last New York hit, period. The Cubs only one hit since the fifth. That was a single by Grace leading off the ninth. Rick Reed, terrific work as a New York starter. Eight innings, four hits, one run, and unearned run. Cubs really missed a golden opportunity there in the 10th inning. Getting very thin on the bench over there. They have one left-handed pitcher, Andrew Lorraine, left in the bullpen as Danny Young, a left-hander, takes over for the Cubs. Two right-handed hitters left off the bench. The Jose Molina, the third catcher, Ricky Gutierrez, who's injured. He can play, but he's definitely hindered. Bobby Valentine, on the other hand, has Matt Franco, his best left-handed pitch hitter, available off the bench. Kurt Abbott, Benny Agbayani, Todd Pratt. Robin Ventura looks at a strike for Danny Young. This is his major league debut, selected from the Pirates organization in the minor league Rule 5 draft in 97. A native of Smyrna, Tennessee. One ball and one strike. He was added to the Cubs 40 man roster during the offseason after recording a 349 ERA in two seasons in the team's minor league system. On the ground at the shortstop Nieves one away and Ventura still in search of his first hit of this season. He has not had good swings at the plate. Eric Bell's put one good swing on the ball tonight, hit a ringing double earlier in the game. The only extra base hit in this ballgame. 
Bell has also fly to right, struck out looking in the fourth inning, grounded to short in the eighth. Ball one high. Todd Seal will follow Bell here in the Mets 11th. Last season in extra inning games, the Mets went six and five. The Cubs at five and six. But the Mets were marvelous in games overall on the season decided by a run. They went 27 and 19 and in games decided by two runs or less 40 and 29. A lot of that has to do with their bullpen. Two and out to Bell. Broken bat flare into left center field. Nieva's out and he's got it. Nice play. This is our first look at Danny Young in this 2000 season. He appears to have a very live arm himself. He gets inside on Derek Bell here, breaks his bat, little floater out behind shortstop. Nieva stays with it all the way, backpedals the last couple of steps, and makes a nice catch. When it really appears that Derek Bell is soul searching a little bit and we're only in the second game of the year he's walking back into the dugout and shaking his head and kind of questioning everything he's doing right now at the plate it looks like by their strike one of Todd Zeal you know a lot more about that than I ever would. Well I'll tell you when you're a hitter at the plate and you just can't find that comfort zone you're a little bit late on the fastball you're out in front of the off speed pitches it can be a very confusing time and you just hate to see it happen early in the season. Dig yourself a hole that's very hard to get out of. You know, the thing was, we were always told early in our career, the first hundred at bats of the season is where you want to really get a good base going. And all these guys are struggling right now to try to put some numbers on the board, get some consistency in each plate appearance, something to build on. Two and one on Zeal. But of course, those pitchers don't want to let you do that. We brought it up earlier, the Mets. Counting so very much on Derek Bell in right field this season. They're not going to come out and say it to put any additional pressure on him. There's enough of that already. Two and two on Zeal. But he's a guy they have to have produce, or they can go from a team who's expecting to go to the World Series to a team that may not make the playoffs. Because there is very little offense in that New York outfield from a power production, run producing kind of situation. Seal a bouncer, and it's under the glove of the Avis, and the Mets have their first hit since a double by Bell in the sixth inning. Zeal, a former Cub, chatting things over with his one-time teammate Mark Grace at first, and now Ordonia is about. He takes ball one down low. The last threat the Mets had in this game came in the sixth inning, when the bases were loaded with two out. Karchner came on and retired Ordonez on a one hopper back to the mound to end the inning. 2 0. Well, it will take a very well placed extra base hit to score Todd Seal all the way from first base. Ordonez, not the kind of guy you worry about hitting the ball out of the ballpark unless the pitcher makes a drastic mistake. So the Cubs once again in the outfield playing very deep defensively. The only thing that can hurt them right now is, as I said, a very well-placed extra base hit. They're trying to prevent that by moving those outfielders back very near where the warning track would be. Danny Young making his major league debut. The pause in the pitch. Ball three to Ordonia. <laughs> Melvin Mora waits in the on deck circle. Yeah, the Cubs only have one reliever left. In that bullpen, Andrew Lorraine. And Mother Nature must have called because he's nowhere in sight. When you get into an extra inning ball game where both offenses appear to be very sluggish and unable to make anything happen. You have to keep a pitcher in reserve that can throw several innings if necessary. And there's ball four to Ordonez. 
So now the Mets have the go ahead run at second with two gone here in the top half of the 11th inning. Melvin Moore last season tore it up in the spring when he hit 421. He was the Mets top rookie in their training camp in 99. Started the season in the minor leagues was up and down three times. Had a huge hit in the ninth inning and scored the winning run on a wild pitch. The wild pitch they'll remember in New York. In the Mets 2 1 win over the Pirates at Shea Stadium on October the 3rd which kept their playoff hopes alive eventually forcing Cincinnati into a one game playoff to advance on to the division series. Well, we have a moment. Have you ever wondered what your sports IQ is? Well, be sure to check out Sports Geniuses weeknights at 6 and 11 on Fox Sports Net, the new nightly game show that puts your sports knowledge to the test. Sports Geniuses, hosted by Matt Baskersian, only on Fox Sports Net. Now Melvin Mora with a winning go-ahead run, pardon me, at second base. And it's high to Mora. We mentioned Moore did it with a glove and the arm in the postseason. He had four outfield assists, one shy of the postseason record set by Lonnie Smith in 85. Hit a home run in the fifth inning of game two of that series against Atlanta. And it's inside. Moore up one of only seven players in National League history to hit a home run in his first league championship series at bat. As Agbayani is now in the on-deck circle. Balls and no strikes. Well, not a lot of room to pace in that Mets dugout. Bobby Valentine taking one step in one direction, turning around and going back the other direction. 3 0. And Morrow looks at a strike. Bobby Valentine, his team needing a big base hit. They scored their lone run back in the fifth. 3 1 pitch. And there's ball four, and the bases are loaded for Benny Agbayani. Valentine, who wants Agbayani because he knows what he's going to get. He's done it at the major league level before where Peyton has it. Now has a chance with Agbayani to perhaps win the game for the Mets. Seal at third, Ordonez at second, Melvin Moore at first with two away. 1-1 one, one game in the 11th. And Young works out of a stretch. Agbayani looks at ball one. Little League cliche, a walk's as good as a hit. It was never more true than it is right now for the Mets. 1-0 on Agbayani. High drive, straight away center field. Buford on the run at the wall. And it is no single home run. Grand slam home run by Benny Agbayani. Virginia. That's definitely going to make the decision considerably harder than it was before that at bat. Benny Agbayani on a 1 0 pitch. The high leg kick reminiscent of Sadahara O. Got a low fastball and golfed it just off the top of the wall, off the hitter's backdrop, and back onto the field for a grand slam home run. Giving the Mets a four-run lead here at the top of the 11th inning. And Peyton smokes one into right. He sees Agbayani get a hit, and he says, hang on a minute. And he doubles off the wall in right. <laughs> Benny Agbayani.
Kayani, 28-year-old native of Honolulu, Hawaii, who hit 14 home runs last season for the Mets. And a huge home run, grand slam here in the 11th. Benny Agbayani built low to the ground and very strong. Watch the high leg kick. The pitch is down below the knees. He's trying to talk it out of the ballpark. Apparently he said the right words as it just does clear that center field fence 406 feet away from home plate. Now Alfonso and he takes upstairs. Rough major league debut for Danny Young. He walks two, allows three hits so far, and four New York Mets runs. That ball looked like it hit the top of the fence, and a very late home run signal given by the third base umpire, Randy Marsh. Well, the hitter's backdrop in center field is very close to the fence. And in Randy Marsh's opinion, that ball after ricocheting off the top of the fence did indeed hit that backdrop and come back onto the playing field. Agbayani's grand slam has given the Mets a four-run lead. And that one's high and outside, two and one on Edgardo Alfonso. Let's take a look at where that ball hit. You see Buford going back, giving it an effort to jump up there, and it hit just above the fence. It's kind of hard to tell. It looks like a railing almost on the top of the fence. That railing is actually behind the fence. Clearly a home run. Great work by our Fox Sports Net crew. Not only right there, but the entire two-game series. And, yes, they've made the long journey over from the United States to bring you this season opening series. 3-1. High fly ball straight away center. Room this time for Buford. And the inning is over, but not before the big blow delivered by Benny Agbayani. A pinch hit grand slam to dead center. The Cubs bat in the bottom half of the 11th, trailing the New York Mets. 5-1 in Tokyo. Told in spring training that the uh, fans here in Japan were looking forward to seeing a 100 mile per hour fastball. And he raised his right arm and said, Well, I'll bring the big nasty with me. <laughs> Shane Andrews, fastball a little bit low. Two and zero on Andrews, and there's a fastball strike. Two and one. The Mets went ten innings with only one run against Cub pitching. They got four of them with one swing of the bat in the top of this eleventh. Good cut by Andrews, and it's two and two. Benitez with that overpowering four seam fastball up high in the strike zone complements it very well with a split finger that gets better with each passing year. Very tough to catch up with those combination of pitches about the only time he gets himself into trouble is when he can't find the strike zone. 2 2 got him swinging and there is. The off-speed pitch by Benitez. Benny Agbayani gives us our Nissan play of the game. And why not? Coming off the bench, a lot of pressure on this young man. We've talked about his situation, and he comes through in an international way for the New York Mets. Agbayani, the pinch hit grand slam. Now it's Jose Nieves. You've really seen the Mets' depth come into play here tonight. Some of the players that have come off the bench for the Cubs, Tarek Brock, and 
Although Jeff Reed did draw a walk, but Leniak and Nieves have done very little, whereas the Mets, Peyton, one of two, he has a double off the bench. Melvin Mora drew a walk and scored a run to get on base in the 11th. That one popped up. Foul ground and Zeal runs into Derek Bell, and neither one of them catch the ball. mentioned it in last night's ball game a lot of foul territory here at the Tokyo Dome all the way down the foul lines Todd Zeal learning a new angle over there at first base this year new teammate Derek Bell they get a little mixed up on this play they both think they have a play on it it hits both gloves neither man able to come up with it Mets leading 5-1 here in the last of the 11th. Nobody on, one out, the 1-2. Foul out of play. The executive producers of Fox Sports Net are Arthur Smith and Bill Borson. The coordinating producer of Major League Baseball is Larry Myers. Today's game produced by Michael Weissman. The head of field operations is Andrea Jenkins, and our technical director is Mitch Riggin. One hopper at Ordonez. Second out of the inning, and the Cubs down to their final out of the game. We'd like to thank our entire Fox Sports Net crew and staff here in Tokyo, and a special thanks to our friends here in Japan with Tamco and Teletech, our facilities and production personnel who very much made us feel at home. Been a wonderful trip for all of us involved. This could be the start of something big. Fastball strike. One and one. Well, a victory here tonight will make that flight back to New York a lot more palatable for the New York Mets. And I think the Cubs, although disappointed by the impending outcome of this ball game, have to be content as well with a split of the two-game series here at the Tokyo Dome. One and two, the count on Joe Girardi. And he fouls it back out of play. And as always, we'd like to thank our outstanding director here tonight. And Bill Webb. He's enjoyed Tokyo this week. Be handling New York Yankees baseball all season long and our Fox Saturday game of the week with Joe Buck Tim McCarver you will join that crew for the World Series on Fox this season very much looking forward to that a long way to go before we get to that World Series and this time of year the great thing about baseball a lot of fans out there think their team is going to be there and the Mets believe that they get a grand slam from Agbayani in the top of the 11th inning and Armando Benitez takes care of business in the bottom half. And these two teams in this historical season opening series in Tokyo, Japan, split the two game series, much to the delight of 110,000 fans in the two game series. The fans enjoyed the games, the players enjoyed the games, and we certainly enjoyed the games. And we say thank you. Domo arigato.